everyone could sit down please and thank you <laughs> and <laughs> hello I hope everyone's having a good day <laughs> so this is the 2017 SCSC team and we are team fire <laughs> verse is Hebrews 12, 28 through 29. Some which cannot be moved, let us have grace, whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear, for our God is a consuming fire. Hello, we are Team Fresh and we served at the Ashaway Church First Hopkinton Church in Rhode Island. And I'm Victoria Richards and I'm from the Blue Mountain Seventh-day Baptist Church in Jamaica. And I am Randy Gannon from the Texarkana Seventh-day Baptist Church. And our team verse is 2 Corinthians 5, 17 and 18. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given us unto a ministry of reconciliation. church in New Auburn, Wisconsin, and we served in the Texarkana, Arkansas church. Hi, I'm Serena Villapando, and our team, ver oh, I'm from Maranatha Community Church in Colton, California. Our team verse is <laughs> Isaiah 40, 31, but those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Hello again, everyone. Hello. <laughs> so serving in the SCSC this year was an honor, one that I am thankful for, because it is my first time, and also my first time leaving Jamaica. I have learned so much during this, the past couple of weeks. I have learned about more about the good news of salvation, more about honoring and keeping the Sabbath, more about spreading Jesus Christ to each and every one. And I just want to encourage us all that as we leave here this week that we promote SCSC in our churches so that other young persons may come and learn and experience this wonderful time in the Lord and to meet new friends. It's such a great opportunity that they will not want to miss. I think of really funny things that I probably shouldn't say, so I'm going to filter myself and not say them. So you can ask me later when I'm not on stage with the mic. Um, mine's going to go a little bit longer. Um, my, this is my third year of SCSC. I went to the Southeast Atlanta Church my first year, and then the last two years I've been to the Bay Area Church. I did not grow up with the SDB culture, so I didn't know any of the dances, the songs, anything. And I had helped lead youth group and been a part of that and a couple other things, like I just fill things when they needed to be filled and supervise things, which I don't know who lets 18-year-olds supervise things, but that was me. Um, so when I went for my first year of SCSC, training was really hard because you learn all the songs, and they were all new for me. And at my church, we didn't do any of the songs, so they were really new for me. And then I went to my project, and 
I thought I knew how to lead because I had helped lead things, but I didn't. So anything good that came out of that year was definitely God, and I had to rely solely on God because I didn't know what I was doing, and I was way over my head, and they were letting 18-year-olds lead things, which is great, and most 18-year-olds can do things. I could not. I probably shouldn't have. And I came back, and they still let me lead things. Then they let me lead things more. It's just this crazy thing of me leading more things. I seem to be doing good at it because they keep asking. But it's just really hard because you you do get pushed with SCSC. It is a growing experience, and you wouldn't trade it for anything. But while you're in it, you're like, you know you're in over your head, and you you have to pray, like, every day, 24-7. Like, kids would show up, pray. Have to talk to a child, pray. Like... Every aspect of it was prayer, constant prayer. And it turned out okay because of God. And that's the only reason it turned out okay, was because of God. And it's because of God that they keep asking me to lead things because I let God lead me. And that was one of the things that SCSE taught me was, I'm a vessel, God is leading, it is not me. And that was one of the coolest things that I learned through SCSE was, it's not me, it is God. Okay, so as Beth and Giovanni have said, that you learn a lot of things in SESC about different cultures and like ways of worship and a lot about your relationship with Jesus. And so we just wanted to share a lot of that with you guys today. And so we put together a video for you guys to watch. SCSC is a leadership development program. It's, it's based primarily on the idea that when you put students in unfamiliar settings, they have an opportunity to rely on God and to develop leadership skills. Now, we don't just want to throw the students into the deep waters, as it were, leaving them unprepared for their projects. So we have training before they head out to serve in the various churches around the country and sometimes even outside the country. To do that, we, we want them to be prepped for a lot of different things. Some of it's project-specific preparation, but then there's a variety of things that we want to accomplish each year. One of the things we want to accomplish is that we confirm their identity as a follower of Jesus Christ, reminding them of the gospel, that they're owned by him and live with him, and that he gives them all sorts of gifts and abilities and calls them to serve him. We encourage them to depend on God and remind them that in those moments when they just don't know what's going to happen next, they can turn to God and he will give them every good gift. We introduce skills that are needed for leadership and then through the years help them develop those skills more and more. We affirm that Christian leadership is based on serving other people. So leadership comes from service. We provide opportunities to exercise authority and help them discover that when they exercise authority well, that builds their own personal confidence, but it also builds confidence in the people around them, in them, and that that leads to people wanting to follow, and that's where leadership comes from. We also teach that leadership isn't just helping people change their behaviors, but leadership is building people up, encouraging them and provoking them to love and good deeds. Leadership, especially Christian leadership, is changing people to be like God. And we work to affirm that while we work and we plant and we encourage and we do all of those other kinds of things, it's always God who gives growth. So Summer Christian Service Corps is built all around leadership development, and all of the pieces we do is focused on that. But it's not just leadership development. It's leadership development in the context of God who calls us to serve him and gives us opportunity to serve others and build each other up. Hi, I'm Serena Villapando. I'm from Maranatha Community Church in Colton, California. And I'm, this is my second year of SESC. I, last year I went to the Mid-Continent Association, which consisted of both Colorado and Nebraska, and then this year I went to Texarkana, Arkansas, Texas, whatever. <laughs> um, in SESC, I learned how to communicate with others and to communicate better with God, and it just 
SCSC has brought me so much closer to God and has made me fall in love with him even more. Hi, my name is Caleb Gammons. I'm from the Texarkana SDB Church. Uh, this is my fifth year in SCSC. I have been to New Auburn, Wisconsin twice, to North and South California, and to Boulder, Colorado on my uh, five-year journey through SCSC. And one thing that I learned in SCSC, if I could sum it all up, is my identity in Christ. SCSC taught me who God made me to be, and it helped me to see and to come to terms with a lot of the areas of my life that have been really on my heart these past five years, and I'm totally changed by it. God is an inspiration, and he's totally going to use you through SCSC, too. He brings us up as leaders. Hello, I'm Victoria Richards from the Blue Mountain Seventh-day Baptist Church in Jamaica, and this year I had the opportunity to serve as a SCSC student at the First Hopkinton Seventh-day Baptist Church in Ashaway, Rhode Island. The experience was really an amazing one. I got the chance to meet new people, try new things, eat new food, and even go kayaking, and that was an experience. Yeah. Over this summer, um, I got the chance to grow as a better leader, to grow close, closer to God, and also what I've learned is that God's plans are perfect. As he said in Jeremiah, he said, before I formed you, I knew you. I ordained you to become a prophet. And I know that God, he had a plan for me to be here this summer. And that was an amazing thing because I got the chance to really minister to people by using the talents that he has blessed me with. And this is just an amazing journey and I'm really happy to be here. Justin Tayo, I'm from the Freedom Community Church in New Auburn, Wisconsin. This is my second year of SCSC. And the projects I've been on have been in Ashway, Rhode Island and Texarkana. And one of the some of the things that uh, guys have been trying to tell me over the years is to keep my eyes focused on them at all times and to not fight for victory, but fight in victory. You know, what really stood out about this year's project that goes with that statement is uh, there was this lady I ended up ministering to on the flight down to Texarkana who had a friend who was in the hospital. And when we landed, we got a message that said he died, but had a second chance in life. And to me, that's basically what happened with Jesus on the cross. He, when he died on the cross and was resurrected, he conquered sin and death. And just what that says to me is no matter what you go through, either it be tribulation, temptation, or whatever it is that life throws at you, God's in control. And you have to believe that you already have victory through all those things. Hi everyone, this is Giovanni Martin from the Blue Mountain Sunday Baptist Church in Jamaica. I serve at the Shiloh Seventh-day Baptist Church in New Jersey this year in SCSC. One thing I've learned in the SCSC this year is that you can spread the love of Jesus Christ through volunteer. Hi, my name is Randy Gammons and I am from the Texarkana SDB Church. And this is my second year in SCSC. I have been to Ashway, Rhode Island twice. So one thing I've learned in SESC is that you don't have to be perfect for God to use you. One of the things I was really concerned with going into SESC my first year was that God wouldn't be able to use me or that I would mess something up. But something I've learned over the past two summers is that it doesn't matter if you stumble over your words or you leave something out of what you're supposed to be saying. If God has something he wants to get across to people, he's going to use you no matter what. Hi, I'm Helen Goodrich. I currently serve as the SCSC Commanding Chairman. I have served in the past as Project Director, as staff person, and currently as Chairman. We, as the committee, oversee all of the student and project applications, and we set up those projects and students after seeking God's will for what would work best for them for their Christian growth. We are developing student leaderships, that's our goal, as the staff is chosen and, and worked, working on their, their goals. The students are considered as well as the projects, always with the goal in mind that student leadership, servant leadership, will continue to build our churches 
and our students and everyone who comes into the program. SESC changes lives. I know this from my experience. It develops leadership. If you look around our denomination, look around our conference this year, you will see people who have been involved in SESC in leadership positions. God uses SESC in many, many ways to develop these leaders and to serve our churches and grow them. SESC is something that changes for a lifetime, and I personally have been a beneficiary of this. It's heartwarming and it's challenging to continue this program and to come back year after year and see what God has done in the lives of our students and our project directors. It's a fun 2017. Enjoy conference. Watch our leaders grow. This presentation is brought to you by SCSC Sunglasses, because our future is bright. <laughs> oh, and, um, so if you do wish to buy a wonderful pair of glasses, they are in the back in the displays. Thank you, and have a great day. Some people really appreciate silence. Sometimes silence can really capture you. But just try to sit silent in a room for several minutes. We have a few announcements Rob Apple is going to share with us. And we will um, just pause for a few minutes. Uh, our program will begin um, just before 7. But right now, we do have announcements. Announcements. And a number of, of announcements. A number of announcements. Important things for people to be aware of. OK, number one. Um, I was asked by uh, some of the folks in the display area, they have up hours um, that they would like to have that open. And the idea is that you would not be wandering around back there, but you would be in here during presentations. And so they're posted on the table, the, the far end of the table as you go in. And if you go in there and you see the hours, what the hours are, please be sensitive to that. We do want you to go in. We do want you to be able to take uh, logoed merchandise back home with you. So we're not saying don't go in there, but we're just saying that um, we'd like you to do that and be sensitive of that area and sensitive to the folks out here. And at the same time, if you see something and you're in there, that area and you see something you like, don't just put money down on the table and walk off because um, that money could walk off later too. So um, just be sensitive to that as well. Um, T starting tomorrow, registration will be downstairs across the sidewalk in MM6, Multimedia 6. So if you need somebody from registration, they'll be over there. However, they're going to be limited hours and limited staff. This is a small campus. They will be around if you need someone call, and they will get there. Um, a number of folks have been going to the folks in registration to talk about things that have to do with maintenance or cleanliness, go directly to Trinity Hall and talk to the university staff people. Our folks in registration don't have the ability to do anything as far as cleaning, and they're just going to pass it on to those folks anyway. Cut to the chase. Go to Trinity. Talk to them. As soon as you go into Trinity, there's an office there, and there's supposed to be folks there clear into 1 a.m. So if you're having problems even at night, you can still go there at 1 a.m., and they're supposed to be staffed. Um, Printing for interest committees. Um, go to the registration area. Uh, there will be a printer there that you can use. If you can't find someone from there, find John Pethel, Nick Kirsten, myself. We will make sure that you get the copies for, uh, re before 
uh, prior to reporting your interest committee uh, information. Lost and found, yes, we do have some lost items already. They are with the registrar's office as well. So go there to where registration is um, and you can claim your items that you've lost. Um, we have a need for cart drivers. If you are over 18 years of age, 25. I'm sorry, 25. that was a test. If you're over 25 years of age, um, we need help with cart drivers. Um, you need to see Eric and Abnett. Um, he was, he's the primary, his brother Jeff is another, and Leroy Burdick is another driver, but you can see any of those, but Eric is the primary. And if you're willing to drive cart for a while, uh, we need some cart drivers. And the last thing I have is, I told you there was a number of things here, um, coffee house. There's a coffee house uh, coming up and um, there's gonna be a sign up sheet for it. And Zach Floyd, is Zach in here? Zach, Zach Floyd is the, the one that you need to see about signing up. Stand up, Zach. You need to, if you want to do something at the coffee house, that's the guy to see. Are you, are you planning on doing a sheet anywhere for them to, hmm? Okay, all right. But he's the guy to talk to if you're interested in the coffee house. All right, thank you. We have a wonderful choir now that's going to assemble over in the choir area. But I thought of a couple other uh, commercials that I might offer here since maybe this a few minutes is free for commercials. Um, first of all, just to remind you, the women's board is going to meet tonight after the evening and the evening reception. And the reception will occur over here. And I think they're going to be meeting over there. So, oh, pardon? The Society, I'm sorry, the Society. I've got to get the right ending there. And um, so invite women, all women that are interested in the doings and the creative future of our women's um, society to feel free to come and plan to join us. Tomorrow night is the youth Somebody and the youth um, and pastors basketball game. I'm looking for a captain of both teams, if you could come find me so that I could get your t-shirts to you so you can dress for the occasion. And then we'll all be enjoying uh, having the opportunity to cheer our favorite age sector <laughs> and gender that we'll be playing. And then last but not least, uh, for the advertising, just to remind you that Wednesday night after the evening presentation, we. Um, Kathy Perdetto um, is uh, partners with a filming company that uh, runs First Line Christian Movies, and they have agreed to come Wednesday evening to show a First Line Christian film, and I believe some of the actors are coming to share their testimonies and how they serve God through media and visual movies and let us enjoy that film. So just put on your agendas if you are deciding whether you're going to go to bed early or stay up really late and you want to partake in some of these things that might take you into the little later hours. There's part of the refreshment time of what we have for you at conference this year, enjoying fellowship and um, a little movie night with your family. So just a few minutes. Um, the choir will present the opening song for this evening's worship. And thank you again for being here this evening. My brain, somebody is missing a key. And these are 50 bucks. So if you're missing your key, you need to come see me. <laughs> I'm pretty visible, so you'll probably know. All right?
Good evening, everybody. Uh, we're going to lead worship from over here. So you have plenty of view for the words, and you're going to know most of the songs. So if you just want to stand with us as we begin worship this, this evening, God, you can have your way here. Lord, we love to worship you. You have given us so many beautiful voices in this room, God, that just want to pour out to you. And um, we just give you thanks, God, for this space and time to just unite us family. It's just so good to be home. And I just, I just thank you for all the love and just for all the ways that I've been seeing you move here. And um, we're just really grateful, God. Forever God is 
trust that, God. We can come to you when we're in need, Lord. We can run to your arms. They're wide open for us. And we just praise you, God, and we thank you for just all that you are. Just bless tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. Guys, I almost died. True story. 60 miles that way, 29, math is hard, and I got it wrong, 27 years ago. I was uh, in Malibu, poor me, that's very sad. <laughs> I was in Malibu when I was swimming in the ocean. And if you've been swimming at the ocean in Malibu, as you all have, and if you have it, now's the time, right? Uh, swimming in the ocean, and Malibu has a massive riptide, and I was nine years old. So I'm out, you know, totally surfing the waves. I'm nine, splashing in the water. And, uh, and the riptide just grabs me and sweeps my legs right out from under me, and now I'm underwater. And, and, and you don't swim against the riptide, but all that knowledge goes out of your mind, right? And you're just fighting for your life, trying to get up, holding your breath as best you can, but... It caught you by surprise, so now you're underwater, and you're thinking, I'm thinking, I'm going to die. This is how I go. Well, we were at the beach because uh, my third grade class had a pen pal relationship with a sixth grade class in Malibu. And so my pen pal was right next to me when I went under, right? And, and he picks me up out of the water. He was in sixth grade, so he was huge, right? <laughs> he picks me up out of the water, and he goes... You okay? <laughs> and I'm like throwing up water, right? But I totally play it cool. <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm, I'm fine. I definitely was not about to die. No problem, right? And I went around and, and, and played the rest of the day. But I will never forget that day. And I will never forget that boy, that young man who saved my life. Todd? Maybe Andrew, Bill, Frank, I don't know. I don't know. And it might, I'm not sure if it was a Tuesday or a Wednesday. It was definitely during the day because they don't send school kids out to swim at night. Uh, it's all, uh, to be honest, it's all a little bit vague. But you know what? Maybe that boy's name was Jesus. You know, I'm thinking Todd. <laughs> I'm thinking Todd. Uh, so it's all, it's so far back, right? It's all kind of vague and mysterious and, and the, the urgency and the, the passion and everything, the, the commitment, I was like, this guy's going to be my lifelong pen pal, right? But that's all faded away now. That's so far back in my past. Well, funny enough, this, about the same year, right around the same time, around nine years old, uh, halfway between here in Malibu at the old LA church, I remember raising my hand. Right? When the preacher said, you know, who wants to give their life to Jesus Christ? I remember that guy's, game, that guy's name. It was Jesus Christ, right? And uh, who wants to uh, invite Jesus into their life? And I raised my hand, right? And, and we prayed that prayer, and it was glorious. And I remember feeling things at that time. And, and I remember the next week, him, there being another altar call, and I was in on that one too. You guys know that story. You do it again and again. And, and, and I remember those moments, but... The urgency of those moments fades, doesn't it? Has anyone here been saved in this past year? They gave their life to Jesus for the first time in the past year? Awesome. How about the last five years? Ten? A few more? Twenty? A few more? Twenty to thirty? That's me. Forty? Fifty? In the last 112 years, how many? In the last 112 years? Look, if you don't see a hand up, we might have a talk with them about, you know, receiving Jesus as their Lord and Savior. That's a good time. Right? We, 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 we've had that moment. We've had that, that encounter with Jesus, an encounter, and we call that salvation, right? We call that being saved, and it's a beautiful moment, and it's an epic moment. But especially if it's been a very long time, some of the, the passion of that moment can fade, can it? 
Often we talk about, you know, people who are just saved, and we see them just lit on fire for Jesus, and they're just telling everyone about this incredible new thing that's happened in their life. And you guys ever feel kind of almost jealous of that? Like, ah, I wish I'd been just saved. <laughs> then I'd be all passionate and stuff like they are. How can we be passionate in our life on mission? How can we feel an urgency in our life on mission if, if our salvation was kind of far away and vague and distant? How can we feel that passion? Uh, well, our scripture today doesn't help us at all, unfortunately, because <laughs> it's about this guy named Peter who's like crazy on fire for Jesus. He's in, he's in the midst of his salvation. It's all fresh and it's all new and he's just on fire and, and preaching for the Lord. And we're going to pick up his story in Acts 3, right? This is the beginning of the church. This is a beautiful thing. And, 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 uh, and Peter and John, they are going up to the temple. Acts chapter 3, starting in verse 1. Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. And a man lame from birth. Man, that guy was lame. He was being carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple that is called the beautiful gate, to ask alms of those entering the temple. Seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked to receive alms. And Peter directed his gaze at him, as did John, and said, look at us. I'm pretty sure he did this. That's across time and space. Look at us. And he fixed his attention on them expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I have no silver and gold, but what I do have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and raised him up, and immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. And leaping up, he stood and began to walk and entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. You know what's cool? They made it into a musical. Sing it with me here. Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have I give thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. He went walking and leaping and praising God. All right, stop. That's, that's... <laughs> the scripture only says it once. <laughs> Incredible miracle, right? Incredible, just act of God. And Peter's there, and the, the faith in that, and the passion in that, and the courage in that. And then he's not done, because he goes and he's just preaching. He preaches up a storm, and thousands of people believe. Thousands of people come and place their faith in Jesus as Lord and Savior. And Peter and John, they're seeing all these people being saved. And the, and the religious leaders, they don't like this, right? Because they thought they took care of this problem. Just a little while ago, right, they crucified Jesus to try to put a cap on this, to put a lid on this, to quiet this whole mess down. And here's Peter and John, and they're just, they're doing miracles, and they're making disciples under the influence of the Holy Spirit, right? Discipling under the influence, that's a DUI, that's illegal. And they, they arrest them. It's a true story. They arrest those guys, and they put them in jail for one night. That's standard, right? Standard. All right, so we pick it up in John chapter 4, and now uh, uh, Peter and John have been dragged in front of, of the religious leaders. In John chapter 4, verse 5, it says, on the next day, so they've been cooling off in jail all night long, right? On the next day, the rulers and elders and scribes gathered together in Jerusalem with Annas the high priest and Caiaphas. Those names should sound familiar because these are the guys who are orchestrating the crucifixion of Jesus, calling for the Roman government to sentence Jesus to death. Uh, Caiaphas and John and Alexander, we don't know who those guys are, and all who were of the high priestly family. And when they had set them in the midst, they inquired, by what power or by what name did you do this? Guys, this is a desperate situation, right? These are, I mean, uh, Peter and John were the guys who were in the room when uh, An Annas and Caiaphas were interviewing Jesus. Right? They were the ones who were there. They know these are the guys that orchestrated the death of Jesus. We are in a desperate situation. This is not good. This could go 
in a very bad direction. But they are not afraid. Somehow. In fact, we know how. It says. Right? They saw... Uh, I skipped. Then Peter, uh, verse 8, then Peter, he's filled with the Holy Spirit. Filled with the Holy Spirit. And he said to them, rulers of the people and elders, if we're being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, you guys, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead. By him this man is standing before you well. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Whew. That is awesome. Right? Filled with the Holy Spirit. And we, so we know, I mean, that the passion, all that comes, it's just pouring out of him, right? But there is a boldness there. There is a passion there in the midst of desperation. To say that, that who, by what right, by what name, by what power was this man saved? Jesus. It was Jesus. That guy. That guy. That guy that you killed. That guy who, whose name has been a black mark, but maybe a name we should be ashamed of. But I'm not ashamed, right? Jesus is the name. And, 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 and he kind of explains his own passion. He explains why he's so passionate about this name, about this person. He says, because there's no one else who could do this. It's Jesus because there's no other name by which we may be saved. Jesus' passion, or Peter's passion, passionate about the name of Jesus because he knows by Jesus alone may we be saved. It's Peter's salvation, right? And seeing the salvation of Jesus in his life and in others' lives, that, that he, he, he learns that boldness. He learns that courage. He learns, he learns that there's, there's no other way. How did he learn that? How did he get that passion? How does he, how does he, he's living life on edge, life on mission, in desperate situations. He's speaking and preaching boldly how does he get that? How did he learn that? Well, the day before, he healed a man. He saw Jesus save someone. That's incredible. Now, I know that Peter was a holier man than I and had greater faith than I. But I've got to think, as he does this move, right? Here's the guy, and his legs don't work. And Peter grabs him by the right hand and pulls him up. Do you think it went through Peter's head in that moment? I really hope this works. Because <laughs> this is going to look really bad, right? Get up and walk. <laughs> right? There's this desperate, these acts of faith He's asking, but, but Peter knew that, that, that this would work, even though this is kind of a desperate move, right? It's kind of a clutch move uh, that, that Jesus would, in fact, save him. Because he's built that confidence that there's no other name by which you may be saved, that Jesus is going to save. That's what Jesus does. He saves. Where did Peter learn that? Jesus, sure, but, but a, a month earlier, right, uh, Peter is destitute. He's in a desperate spot again because Jesus is dead. And that's not good for Peter. Right? He is, he's the guy who goes into the tomb, looks around, nobody, I don't know. And he leaves wondering. And then Jesus shows up. He's in a room with the other disciples, afraid of those same religious leaders. But Jesus shows up and Jesus saves in fact, Peter's a guy, I love him. He keeps doing stupid stuff, and Jesus keeps saving the guy over and over and over again, right? When do you think Peter was saved? You know, what, what's Peter's date of salvation? When did Peter put his faith in Jesus? We don't know exactly, but I know this. Jesus saves Peter over and over and over and over again. 
And we hear Peter speaking the words. We hear when Jesus starts to say crazy stuff like, hey, guys, eat my flesh and drink my blood. <laughs> and most of his disciples go, dude, I'm out. That's weird. And everyone, and even the disciples were troubled. This is weird. And Jesus says, are you going to leave too? You know what Peter says? Where else can we go? Where else could we go? You've got the words of life. And we believe you are the Holy One of God. That sounds a lot like there is no other name by which we may be saved. Which says this, Peter has been learning this and learning this and learning this. And it looks like this. It looks like this. You're following Jesus, and that's life on mission, right? You're following Jesus, life on mission. And, and, and following Jesus, life on mission, will always send you into a, a desperate place, terrifying place. Because that's the kind of place Jesus goes, right? Desperate place, I need to be saved. And then Jesus saves. Now you can't see my face, I'm over here. All right, Jesus saves. And that awakens the passion within you and gives you the courage to then step into greater life on mission, right? But then that takes you to scary and dangerous places. And you reach the end of yourself and you say, I need to be saved. And Jesus saves, which gives you passion, which leads you on to life on mission. And you go like this. It's this upward spiral, right? And, and it, it begins in that moment we think of you know, we think of, this is my salvation. This is when I was saved. It begins when our desperate place is lost in sin and death and separated from, forever from God, right? And Jesus saves, right? And we enter. He sends us into the world on his mission. And we have that passion. But guys, salvation doesn't stop there. We were saved and Jesus saved us. We still get saved, and Jesus continues to save us. We will be saved, and he will save us. I have a very complicated definition for salvation. You guess what it is? When Jesus saves you. In big ways, epic forever ways, and in small ways, right? In ministry ways, in, in eternity ways. All of it, all of it together, it's pervasive. Right? It's past, present, it's future, it's salvation, and Jesus saves, and he saves, and he saves. Jesus saves us. That continuity of salvation should be building passion within us and building courage to step into desperate situations because we've been in desperate situations again and again and again and again. I'm not making this stuff up. Later, Peter writes it down. 1 Peter chapter 1. He starts to capture this idea uh, and, and familiar words, uh, starting in 1 Peter chapter 1, starting in verse 6. In this you rejoice. What's the this? So all of you who have your Bibles open, you get 10 Jesus points. But you can look up and see chapter 5, because I didn't, or verse 5, I didn't put it up there. Right? He's already talking about salvation. He's already in the context of being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. This salvation, and this is kind of the, the, the future, past, present, not yet kind of salvation. And he continues, verse 6, In this salvation you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. That sounds like desperate situation. You've been grieved by various trials so that the tested genuineness of your faith more precious than gold that perish, perishes, though it is tested by fire, it may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. That's Jesus actively making himself known in your life, not just then, but now. The revelation, ongoing, present revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you've not seen him, it creates within you. You love him. You love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible. That's where you run out of words. It's inexpressible. I can't even tell you guys how much joy has been built within me, Peter says. I can't even express how much joy I have in the salvation of Jesus Christ that I've learned through times of trial. 
inexpressible joy, filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the goal of your faith, the result of your faith, the purpose of your faith, the destination of your faith, the telos of your faith, the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Peter, at this point, has been riding this spiral for a while, right? He is on fire. He is passionate. He is living out life on mission, and he's fearless. He's willing to go anywhere because he's been everywhere and Jesus showed up and saved. He's willing to talk to anyone because he's talked to everyone and he's seen Jesus step into their life and do what? Save. All week long we're talking about life on mission, life on mission. We only have life because Jesus saved us, right? We only have mission because Jesus sent us. And what did he send us to do? Bring his salvation to everyone else. Jesus wants to save. He saved you, and he wants to save all. How can we reawaken the passion of our salvation? It's to realize that it's not something that happened long ago. Jesus saved, and he saves, and he will save. Every time he saved me, right, it gives me that courage to know he's going to save me again, and again, and again, so that I can step into crazier things, so that I can go pick up people who have no legs, see if I can drag them up. It doesn't always work, right? But, but, but... Jesus always, that's what Jesus does, right? Jesus saves. We think of it in, in huge ways, and I think back to that day. But I, I think back over uh, my past year and moments where I didn't really know how to move forward. But you know who did? Jesus. It wasn't Todd. <laughs> Jesus saved. He saved me then. He saved me this year. For those of you who, who, who are regularly in the pulpit, you know when you step onto that stage, you're in a desperate situation. <laughs> and God shows up, and Jesus saves, and it gives you the courage to get up there again. And oh, look, I am now again in a desperate situation. Great. But Jesus saves, and he will always save. Where are you on this cycle? Where are you in this journey? If you've been comfortable for a very long time and you haven't found yourself in a desperate situation, I encourage you to enter into this thing called life on mission. It may be mission to your neighbor. It may be mission on the other side of the world. It may be mission to the teller at Walmart. But you step into mission, you're going to find yourself in a desperate situation very quickly. If you're in a desperate situation, don't believe me, believe Peter. Peter who says, oh, guys, this is going to be good. Because I know Jesus is going to show up, and Jesus is going to save, and you're going to get to be a part of that, and then you're going to learn this inexpressible joy that is the focus, the goal of the salvation of your souls. Sweet Moses, that's really big. If you are uh, in that place of salvation, right? I mean, some of you are so on fire. It is amazing. And I am so inspired by your passion. Some of us sometimes have to be obedient instead of passionate, right? Be responsible instead of passionate. And this is a room full of people who have been obedient and responsible and faithful for a very long time. My prayer this week, as we're talking about life on mission, is that Jesus would reawaken within us the inexpressible joy of our salvation. I'm going to have the worship team come forward, and uh, I want to do a little exercise bringing to mind our salvation and just dwelling in it.
bringing to mind our salvation and just saying, God, thank you. Jesus, thank you. I'm going to give you three things to kind of hold in your mind, and we'll have some, some uh, reflective music for a bit, and then we're just going to worship. But uh, three things. I want you to reach back to that day, however long ago, that you first put your faith in Jesus Christ. Reach back, and you may not, like me, you may not be able to picture many of the details. But you can picture Jesus. Jesus there with you. Jesus saving you. And there's no other name by which we may be saved. Reach back to that day, and, I, and, and then I want you to pick a day in the last two years. All right? A bad day. A bad week. A bad season. A time of desperation. I want you to bring to mind a time of desperation and then see where, where, where did Jesus show up? Where did Jesus show up and save you? How did he save you? Maybe it wasn't how you expected or how you are expecting. Jesus likes to surprise us. But I know this, Jesus saved and he saves and he will save. Where did and how did Jesus save you? And say, thank you, Jesus. And then this may be harder. I want you to picture today. And maybe it was a big thing and maybe it was a little thing, right? But Jesus was with you today. And you know what Jesus does when he shows up? He saves. Where's Jesus been today? Maybe it was a word spoken earlier today. Maybe it was a worship song. Maybe it was an encounter. Maybe it was that awesome tree that goes horizontal for like 15 feet. Thank you, Jesus. That's amazing. Right? Whatever it was, what, what is it that Jesus has done in you to bring his ever-present, ever-always salvation, to plant that inexpressible joy within you? Take a few moments to work through those three things and just say, thank you, Jesus, for saving me yesterday, last year, today. Thank you, Jesus, for always saving me, for there's no other name by which we may be saved. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for saving us. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. Awaken within us, Lord, the passion of your salvation. Reveal to us inexpressible joy. Even as you save us from desperation, Lord, make us desperate for your name. Even as you have saved us, God, send us that all may be saved.
Breathe into us life. Breathe into us passion. In your name, the only name by which we may be saved, we worship you, O Jesus. Amen. We're actually going to go back and do What a Beautiful Name. I think it might have been a new song for a lot of you, but maybe some of these lyrics will just resound a little bit, um, maybe a little bit differently in your heart. And I know we're missing part of the, the verse there, so I'm going to try to um, speak it out to you. But it's just so powerful. Death could not hold you. The veil tore before you. You silenced the boast of sin and grave. The heavens are roaring, the praise of your glory, for you are raised to life again. You have no rival. You have no equal. Now and forever, God, you reign. Yours is the kingdom. Yours is the glory. Yours is the name above all names. It's this name, this powerful God that's in love with us that we can worship. So just stand with us as we sing this song. You were the word at the beginning.
we go. In the name of Jesus of Nazareth, pick up your Bibles and your phones and your stuff and walk in his mission because of his salvation and for his salvation and for his glory. In Jesus' name we go. Amen.